Sorry about that. Sorry for all the breaks. It's just uh, been one of those mornings, so hopefully we can get through this. I'm not quite sure where I left off. I believe I was talking about stage one of syphilis, primary syphilis. Uh, and I'm gonna probably repeat some things here that I've already said, but let me just go ahead and reiterate. There are no silent carriers like we saw with gonorrhea. About 25% of infected individuals will see a spontaneous cure. And uh, if we were to test them at this point, run a serological test for uh, antibody levels, it might be negative. It can be difficult to accurately screen for syphilis during the primary stage of the disease. Again, treatable with penicillin. Uh, if the patient is not treated uh, or they don't see a spontaneous recovery, they are going to progress to stage two, which is secondary syphilis. This occurs six weeks to six months after the chancre resolves. Uh, it's a systemic infection at this point. We're going to see um, lesions uh, can occur on the mucous membranes, can occur in other parts of the body as well. Uh, you'll see there's a, a, a photo in your outline of a generalized body rash. Now this rash has a fluid associated with it and that fluid is very rich in spirochetes, so that is potentially uh, contagious, that material. All right, let's see. Other symptoms that the patient is going to experience during the, the secondary stage of syphilis include a fever, um, malaise. I, I should add, the I, I really shouldn't say fever, a slight increase in temperature, maybe by a degree or two. All right, malaise, uh, white patches on the lips and the tongue, and during secondary syphilis, this is the best time to screen. Antibody titers are going to be highest at this point. All right, treatment, once again, uh, it is treatable with penicillin. Uh, if for whatever reason this doesn't occur, we're not likely, it is possible, but not likely to see a spontaneous recovery during secondary syphilis. Uh, so if neither of those things happen, then we're going to progress to the um, uh, stage three, which is known as the latent stage of syphilis. Okay, now here's what's going on, you guys. The host's immune system is going to, at some point, reach a, let's say, a stalemate uh, with the pathogen. And so symptoms are going to disappear, no outward signs uh, of the disease at this time. The only evidence that we would have that this patient does have syphilis is to do an antibody titer test. They would test positive. This uh, latency period, it can occur more than once. It can occur during uh, um, secondary and tertiary stages. Um, and um, the patient may begin to experience tertiary symptoms, have another period of latency. So there's some back and forth that's possible with this. Now, as the disease progresses, and we're talking uh, years into this now, it becomes less contagious and also um, uh, less responsive to treatment. What I mean by less responsive to treatment is this. We can still treat the patient. We can treat them at any time. And the organism, the treponemes, will be killed, but any damage that's been done to that individual is not going to be reversible. All right, stage four, tertiary syphilis. This occurs five to 40 years later. Uh, it's very destructive because we're going to see the development of devastating ulcerating lesions called gumas. And I've got some uh, photos for your viewing pleasure in your outline, so you can take a look at those. Uh, they bleed, and I already mentioned that they ulcerate. There is uh, really not going to be any chance of a spontaneous cure at this point. Uh, there are really no um, uh, outward signs once those lesions resolve. And I find this difficult to believe, but this is what my research has, uh, has shown. One in four infected individuals, this has to be a worldwide number, one in four people infected with syphilis will progress to the tertiary stage. All right, so we're seeing damage to all of the body systems uh, over this period of years. We're going to see things like uh, nervous system damage, cardiovascular system damage, uh, and some of the symptoms will include blindness and deafness, severe liver damage, and as the disease progresses, dementia and uh, insanity and finally death. We can still treat with IV penicillin for 10 days, 
that will kill the treponemes, but as I said earlier, any damage that's been done to the patient is not reversible. All right, a little bit about congenital syphilis. The spirochetes are able to cross the placental barrier and infect the fetus. It can occur at any stage of the disease, but it's most likely during uh, primary and the secondary stages. Now the consequences include stillbirth, infant disorders including deafness, neurologic impairment, and bone deformities. If you take a look in your notes, you'll see a photo of some deformed teeth. They are called Hutchinson's teeth, very characteristic of congenital syphilis infections, and even uh, perforations of the palate are possible. Now, only the severe cases are apparent at birth, and if we are aware that the child is infected, we can go ahead and treat with IV penicillin, uh, penicillin G, for 10 days. The damage that's been done up to that point is irreversible, but we can prevent further damage from occurring. All right, let's now talk about lymphogranuloma venarium. Now, first of all, let me uh, calm your fears because this is a disease that occurs primarily in the tropics, and it's going to begin with painless genital lesions, which may go unnoticed, caused by chlamydia tracheomatis. Now, it really doesn't have meaning to refer to this organism as gram-positive or gram-negative. It's very tiny, lacks a cell wall. It's an intracellular parasite, so I won't ask you anything about its gram designation. All right, um, transmission is usually through uh, intimate sexual contact. Incubation, three to 30 days. Symptoms will include those painless genital lesions that I mentioned earlier, fever, chills, headache, joint pains, and anorexia. The lymph nodes of the groin may become inflamed, and the result of this will be that lymph fluid is able to travel down, uh, but it can't drain away, and this can cause a gross enlargement of the uh, lower limbs and the genitalia as well. I believe I may have a photo of that in your notes. If so, I apologize. Uh, while this is a very debilitating disease and it can have a long run, it's rarely fatal. Uh, it's treated with tetracycline. The treatment may take weeks to months and surgical intervention might be required to drain that excess lymph fluid. All right, next on the list is non-gonococcal erythritis and uh, sometimes called NGU, and what that term literally means is it's not gonorrhea. Instead, it's chlamydia. There are a couple other organisms that can cause this sort of generalized condition. I've listed them in your outline. Uh, the symptoms include a, um, a discharge, either from the penis or the vagina, depending on our, our, um, our patient. Women may be asymptomatic. This is not uncommon. And uh, treatment would be, tetracycline would be our first choice erythromycin a second choice and by all means treat both uh, sexual partners. Oh, this can be seen in newborns as uh, eye infections. Now remember I mentioned earlier in this lecture that a multi-antibiotic ointment is used to treat the eyes of newborns for potential gonorrhea infections. This would also help uh, if they were infected with uh, chlamydia as well. Okay, next on my list is the disease known as chlamydia caused by the same organism, chlamydia tracheomatis. Uh, most commonly reported sexually, tra sexually transmitted infection in the United States. In 2011, there were 1.4 million reported cases. Probably, in reality, there were twice that number of cases. Not all infected individuals are symptomatic, at least not initially. They may be asymptomatic or subclinical for years. Uh, for that reason, this is also this is often, excuse me, referred to as a, the silent infection. Incubation, one to three weeks, but like I said, we may not see symptoms for quite some time. In the female patient, we will see a vaginal discharge, uh, burning and in itching sensation upon urination, bleeding after intercourse, pelvic inflammatory disease is a possibility, and as a result of that, so are ectopic pregnancies. Permanent sterility is a possibility. In the male patient, discharge from the penis, burning sensation when they urinate, swelling of one or both testicles, and complications in men are rare with the exception of sterility. 
All right, now uh, congenital infections with chlamydia are also a possibility, and some of the consequences include uh, preterm labor, preterm rupture of membranes surrounding the fetus, and low birth weights. Uh, the consequences of neonatal infections include um, eye and lung infections of the neonate. We can diagnose by uh, swabbing um, appropriate tissues and doing a gram stain or doing serologic tests. And deoxycycline is the drug of choice for this infection. Uh, azithromycin is another possibility uh, for treating chlamydia. Okay, let's talk about toxic shock syndrome. While this isn't uh, technically a sexually transmitted infection, because of the associated with tampons, it seemed like the place to talk about it. Right, a little bit of history. First of all, the first um, major outbreak of toxic shock syndrome that we were aware of began in uh, late 1979 um, and um, into early 1980. There were about a thousand cases. About 99% of those were women. And most of those women were menstruating and using a particular brand of tampon. I think it was called, um, oh, here we go. Rely Upon was the brand name. It was a, uh, a Procter & Gamble product. And uh, I so apologize for telling you this, but the product was developed in response to requests for a tampon that a woman could wear through her entire menstrual period instead of having to change it uh, every couple of hours as any sensible human being would do. So bad idea to begin with. Well, um, as a result of this, uh, if there were um, any uh, cells of Staphylococcus aureus available, and that's the usual causative agent, Staph aureus, gram-positive coccus, uh, they could multiply and produce a toxin. Remember, we talked about the um, toxin that Staph aureus produced that caused, caused food poisoning. This is a slightly different toxin. It's called toxic shock syndrome toxin 1. You should have that in your notes. There were a few cases of uh, toxic shock syndrome occurring in adults, uh, adult males and children. Uh, those cases were a little bit more difficult to explain. Uh, all of the patients though did have severely depleted magnesium levels, so I'm not sure what the link is there, but anyways, that was noted. All right, so Staph aureus causes the disease. Symptoms are going to include a fever, vomiting, diarrhea, a a uh, significant decrease in blood pressure, causing the patient to go into shock. They will also develop a sunburn-like rash that will undergo a deep peel about 10 days after it begins. Definitely going to require hospitalization for this one and antibiotics. Clindamycin is, uh, is one, possible, one possible treatment. I wanted to mention that in addition to tampons, surgical packings like uh, like they put up the sinuses after nasal surgery. If those aren't changed frequently enough, that patient could potentially develop toxic shock syndrome. All right, you guys, thanks for listening. I hope to see you soon.